So he understood. I mean, it's clear from his letters that he understood he says so. And he's, he's very loving in, in what he says to her. He goes to see her father's grave, which is in Vienna, and tells her he's, he's, he's taken some care of that and, and so on. It's, it's very sad. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Liz Cohn has been researching Alice Glasnarova, who was imprisoned as part of the early Cold War Czechoslovak show trials known as the Slansky Trials. These were amongst the most notorious show trials of the 20th century, with the prosecution and sentencing to death of Rudolf Slansky, General Secretary of the Czechoslovak Communist Party, and ten other defendants who had been arrested in a brutal purge ordered by Stalin. Alice Glasnarova was Liz's father's first wife, and when Liz started researching Alice's life, she'd never seen a picture of her and had never read a word that she had written. All she knew was that Alice had been married to her father and had been a member of the Communist Party. Liz has pieced together a tragic story of a couple, although deeply in love, separated by the difference in their political views which ultimately resulted in pain, disillusion and betrayal. Now, you might think there's a vast army of research assistants, audio engineers and producers putting together this podcast, but you'd be wrong. The podcast relies on your support to enable me to continue to capture these incredible stories and make them available to everyone for free. If you'd like to help preserve Cold War history and enable me to continue to produce this podcast, you can via a one-off or monthly donation. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate for more details. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us, as well as sharing us on social media. It really helps us get new guests on the show. Now, back to today's episode. I'm delighted to welcome Liz Cohn to our Cold War conversation. One theme that I feel that runs through this story is of her independence and her single-mindedness. She's, I'm trying not to generalise this too much, but she seems quite unusual for this period in terms of what she does and how she acts as well. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting because her mother certainly didn't want her <laughs> to go in the direction that she did. Her mother wanted her to, you know, to make a good marriage and to, uh, you know, to have a to, to have social advancement, which was obviously something that Alice was not interested in at all. Um, and um, yeah, so she, she was she was an independent spirit, and Helena, her friend, was as well. So I think the two of them together were quite. Quite a bold pair, really. Yeah, quite a formidable duo from mm. uh, what what I can make out. And so, how, how does she meet your father? Um, I think she met him when she was at university in Prague. He was also at university in Prague. He was a bit older than she was. Uh, he was studying medicine, and but he came from a little town in Slovakia called Jilina, which is not very far from Ljubljana. And I think the Jewish students. Um, the Slovak students, probably there was a group of them and through them she got to know him. And she she was the first female lawyer in that town, I think you said. Yeah, when she graduated, she she actually went back, first of all, to Rujomborok because her father had died and uh, so she sort of partly went to, to look after her mother and, and younger sister and she was the first female lawyer in Rujomborok. And then when, when she and my father married in 29... Uh, they moved to Zilina, which is where his family came from, and he um, and she was the first female lawyer there as well. So, yeah, she was quite a pioneer. Indeed, indeed. And as as you mentioned, she's developing socialist views and is obviously of a of a left wing persuasion. But with your father, what what was his politics like? He was a social democrat. And I think at that time, the differences between 
him as a social democrat when they when they met him as a social democrat and her as a as a communist were, were not too great you know their values were were pretty similar and and the communists were relatively recently formed in in Czechoslovakia um so i think although alice was always more involved in 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 communist in socialist ideals and politics than he was um their their values were not so different i mean she became they were they were both involved in the social democratic party to begin with in jilina but alice's sympathies were moving towards the communists and she carried on going to meetings with my father um and reporting back to the communists they said don't join the communist party yet we'd rather you reported back on what's going on with the social democrats so already there was a little bit of a division there going on um she she joined the friends of the ussr and she actually went for six weeks on a study tour to 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 the soviet union it it, it obviously didn't add any concerns about what was going on i mean because there were show trials going on in in the soviet union in in the 30s so you know she, but she what she didn't seem to be aware of that I mean, she actually um there was a there was a talk in jilina which was quite controversial where somebody was was refuting the the views of andre gide who had who had who had been to also to the soviet union and had had been quite critical of it um but of the but the attitude in jilina amongst the communists there was 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 at, was against those those views so as far as i know she she came back being impressed i think you also have to remember how sort of old fashioned the world was and how in in austro-hungary and then even the beginnings of czechoslovakia that it was a it was a very formal world where people were very respectful and and i think to go to the soviet union and see men and women working alongside each other and everybody being called comrade and that sort of equality i think that must have seemed quite appealing actually yeah yeah and i think people sort of forget that to some degree that a lot of well, not, um, i was going to say a lot but a lot of what we experience today in terms of equality was very much groundbreaking in those times in in the soviet union and and certainly women would have seen it as very invigorating i would think to to see that that equality or appear to see that equality there because i mean the equality was only to a certain level wasn't it yeah it it seemed like that at the time i think it seemed as though women were going to be treated um in with with greater equality and that they were you know they were they were going to be expected or allowed whichever way you look at it to um to work alongside men i mean of course what happened later was very different but but at that time i think it seemed as though that was what communism was offering so she doesn't join the party immediately it's 1936 when she joins the communist party and that is a very important year for both the communist party and i guess for european history because it's the start of the spanish civil war which is an iconic event for the left wing certainly during the the 1930s Yes, and and also you have to remember that Czechoslovakia was 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 a neighbour of Germany, and, and and by that time Hitler was enacting laws as well, and uh, and I think that it was it was possible to see, and they you know they were very well educated, they spoke German, they well, they spoke English, they spoke French, they you know they could read um, newspapers and books and, and articles from from all over Europe. And they knew what was going on, and it was very. If you were Jewish, particularly, it was very, very worrying. And and then obviously, what what was going on in Spain as well. And it seemed as though Spain was the only place that anybody was challenging that that fascist ideology. Alice actually goes to Spain and leaves Irwin behind. Yes, her her friend Helena goes slightly before she does. Um, she she went in sort of may 37 by which time you know the the, the the civil war was well underway and and mussolini and hitler were 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 on the side of franco very obviously and and then hitler would use the luftwaffe to bomb you know the the basque town of guernica so and the soviet union was very clearly you know on the side of of the republicans and was intervening in that way as well so she was going into a 
yeah. sides that were very clearly defined by the time she got there. Um, I mean, Helena was a, was a pharmacist, and so it was obvious what she was going to do. She was, went to work with the International Brigade Hospitals. The, the Czechs sent money to set up a Czech hospital for the International Brigade fighters, and Helena volunteered to work there as a pharmacist. Alice, as a lawyer, it wasn't quite so obvious what she would do, really. But she, when she got there, she ended up working as administrator in, in the various hospitals. But in the summer of 37, she was getting letters from Helena about what was what it was like. And I think she couldn't bear to stay away any longer. And she knew my father wouldn't approve. And so she said she was going on holiday to Belgium to visit her mother and sister who were holidaying there. And um, and then and from she went to Paris and asked the communists to help her get to Spain, which they did. I mean, she did go and visit her parent, her mother, and I'm sure they were absolutely horrified. Her mother was horrified to hear what she was going to do, and um, and she took the train. She took the train with some other comrades down to Perpignan, and then they were they were taken by boat from Cerbère, which is a little village just on the on the border across the border into Spain to Port Bou, which is the little village on the Spanish side. And from there, she went to Figueres, where there's a fort and where the, a lot of the international brigades sort of gathered and uh, and sent a telegram to my father explaining where she was and saying that they belonged to two different worlds. So I think, you know, that was quite a, a defining moment, really. We've mentioned the international brigades. It's worth describing who they are. And the international brigades were international volunteers from various countries including britain um the us uh czechoslovakia even german volunteers as well who wanted to fight on the side of the republic even italian fighting against franco yeah and even italian, even italian as well sides, yeah yeah um and this was a a sort of uh very powerful moment for the left wing in in europe because it was you know a chance to try and turn this tide of fascism that was appearing to be in a a, a, quite an unstoppable wave across europe what with the rise of hitler and also mussolini in italy who'd been in power for significantly longer than um than hitler had and uh you know to to stop it happening in spain as well Mm. yeah i mean to Towards the end, she was. They were in Benicassim for, for for several months, but then, as the nationalists advanced, they had to move north um, to, to to make sure that they weren't cut off by the nationalist advance. And so they went to Barcelona, and then the next place that the hospital was was in Mataró. But what I think is quite important to say is that as the Republicans were clearly losing the fight, the Soviets started to look for for scapegoats. Um, for, as to why, and Alice and her friends, both Helena and a doctor called Dora, whom she she became friends with while she was out in Spain, were all accused of demoralising the troops and of having stolen preserves from the um, from the hospital. And they they were they had to appear in front of a communist tribu- tribunal in Barcelona. Nothing was proved against them, but as a result of that their communications were intercepted and censored and read. And in fact, I have some of the letters that were intercepted by by the the communist authorities in Spain afterwards. But that particular incident becomes quite important later. Indeed, it does. I mean, you mentioned the telegram that she sent to your father. Have you any indication of what the reaction was from Irwin? carry on communicating with her while she was there and he did send things out to her while she was there including medicines for the hospital but i think he was very dismayed that that uh, that she that, that that's what she had done um the only the only comment i have about his fe- on his feelings about that was in something he wrote for the interrogatory which was for the, for a particular audience. I haven't mentioned the interrogatory, but actually it's quite important because that was my starting point in researching Alice. My father in 1954 was working for the World Health Organization. He was a, an American civil servant and he had to fill in a form that all international civil servants had to complete 
saying whether saying that he hadn't he wasn't a communist basically and um and in responding to that he said his first wife had been a communist and because of that they then sent him an additional questionnaire in which he had to write in much more detail about his marriage and the reasons for the divorce and so on and that was my starting point in the research that was the first thing first sort of detail that I got that I knew really about what had happened in their marriage but it is obviously for a very specific audience it's for the American government proving that he's not a communist so you have to read it in that light what happens to her after the Spanish Civil War? Um, she left Spain in August of thirty eight and actually was arrested as soon as she got into France. Uh, she went over, they walked over the border, over the mountains to France, and were arrested. She and four other comrades arrested straight away and imprisoned for a month because they 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 were without a, a visa. But after that, when she was released, she returned to Czechoslovakia and got back to Zilina, end of August uh, 1938. And um, and obviously that was just before the Munich Agreement. And um, so she returned. And as a result of the Munich Agreement, Slovakia became an autonomous state uh, under the rule of the Slovak nationalists. And the leader of the Slovak nationalists was a priest called Joseph Tiso, who was who was very much a fascist and was indicted for war crimes after the war and was amongst you know one of the first rulers to to ship a lot of a lot of Jews to Auschwitz um so in 38 when they when they knew what was happening they they wanted to leave Czechoslovakia um and luckily my father had an american passport although he had been brought up for most of his life in Czechoslovakia and for in Jelena. He actually was born in New York because his parents had emigrated in the 19th century, had met there, married. He was born there. And then in 1910, they'd returned home. So he still had an American passport, which made it much easier for them to leave. And so in December 38, he went to America and Alice followed a year later. So quite a close escape then for the pair of them. Yes, I think Slovakia had become quite anti-Semitic. I mean, by the time Alice returned, I think my father could have told her about many incidents of anti-Semitism and they only grew. And very, very sadly, my father's parents, my grandparents, uh, could have gone to America with them, um, but chose not to. They, they, They wanted to stay in what they saw as their home and they felt they were old and nobody would bother with them. And that, you know, there'd been anti-Semitic waves persecutions before and they could they could last it out and of course they couldn't so tragic story so many families in Mm. eastern europe what do owen and alice do in 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 the u.s are they are they sort of reconciled at that point or i guess so i mean they were apart for a whole year while she was in spain and then they were together for three months and he went to America and then they were apart for another year because he was in America. He was he had to do the American exam so that he could practice as a doctor in the States because they didn't recognize his European qualifications. Um, and so he went a year early and she wanted to make sure that her, her mother and her sister were safe, um, which they were. And so she joined him then in 38. So I guess, yes, they did. They did come together. It was a slightly tricky time for communists because the Soviet Union had made a pact with Hitler, hadn't they? The non-aggression pact. Mm. And people like Alice had seen firsthand the danger of Hitler um, in Spain and in Czechoslovakia. And so I think it was quite difficult to to reconcile the Communist Party policy (laughs) of not getting involved in the war when she felt you know, that, that in a way they needed to. But when they were, went into the war, then they were all on the same side. Alice worked for something called the International Workers' Order when she was in America, which was a communist organisation, and she worked in the Slovak section. And she also was a volunteer uh, in various refugee organisations, helping people escape from from uh, from Europe into America, often via Mexico. And my father joined the army in 1942 when America joined the war, he joined the army and was with the second evacuation hospital and was sent sent to Europe and was with went over on the D-Day landings and followed the American army 
through into France and Belgium and then ultimately into Germany. Did he talk to you about that at all or did he never spoke about it, but I have letters now <laughs> as a result of the thoroughness of the Communist Party confiscating things, um, particularly a letter in which he describes he was at the liberation of Buchenwald and um, wow. and and had to set up a hospital, a TB hospital for the, the survivors. He found his uncle there and some schoolmates there. Oh my and goodness! He was also sent to um, to denazify certain hospitals and to arrest the Nazis that were there. And he and he he was he he got some some medals from it. He was ideal because he spoke German, um, yeah. as you know, and uh, and yet obviously he was American. And he 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 said he he got the reputation of of the guy who could be tough on the Nazis. So I think he really enjoyed seeing his Jewish name being put up above the hospitals. That yeah. uh, that he was taking over, yeah. God, that must have been incredible to find relatives still alive in in that camp. I can't mm. imagine no. um, what that moment would have been like, to be honest. But thank mm. thanks for thanks for um, sharing that. Uh, so, with with the end of the war, what does Alice do next? Well, obviously, Alice was desperate to return to Czechoslovakia as soon as she could. My father didn't go back to to America until December 45. And it was at that time, between the end of the war and my father's return, that she met Noel Field. And that proved to be a, a hugely significant event in both their lives. Um, shall I just say a little bit about Noel Field? Yeah, yeah. Who Who is no, Noel Field? Okay, Noel Field was an American. He was brought up in, in, in Switzerland, spoke German, went to school in Switzerland. His parents were both American. Then he went to Harvard. Then he joined the State Department and the League of Nations. He was very idealistic, a bit naive, really. A bit so socially sort of awkward, really. And he became very interested in communism. He read a lot about it. And while he was working at the State Department, he was recruited by the Russians. He 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 was he was very much um, he was very very sympathetic to that. And one of his best friends, then Lawrence Duggan, also volunteered to work for the for the for the Soviets. He knew Al Jahis. He was friendly with Al Jahis. Um, who was working for the GRU, which is the, the military intelligence branch of the, the Soviet Union. And people did begin to suspect, he wasn't particularly subtle about it, um, people yeah. did begin to suspect his communism, and actually that was one of the reasons that he, he left the State Department uh, and also the League of Nations. And by the time he met Alice, he was working for the Unitarian Service Committee, and he'd been working throughout the war in Geneva, helping refugees from occupied Europe and helping and particularly helping the communists because that was where his sympathies lay. And so, um, and he'd met a couple called the Pavliks who were Czech, who knew Alice well. In fact, Alice had worked in Geza Pavlik's law firm when she first graduated in Rouge They were vaguely related. And the Pavliks suggested that when he went to America, went back to America, he, he look up Alice, uh, which he did. And they got on quite well because they were, you know, their, their sympathies were very similar. And of course, Alice was desperate to have any news from anybody she knew in Czechoslovakia. And my father hadn't yet returned. So that was how they got to know each other. She, Alice had no idea that he was actually working. She, she knew he was, he had communist sympathies. She had no idea he was working for the Soviet Union. And Field wanted to set up a medical teaching, well, the Unitarian Service Committee wanted to set up a, a medical teaching mission to various European countries, to Czechoslovakia and then Austria, Poland, Finland, because those the doctors in those countries had missed out on a lot of the developments that had happened during the war, because obviously mm. you know, under Nazism they weren't allowed to know about any of them. And actually Czechoslovakia had lost a huge percentage of its doctors because they were Jewish and uh, they'd either been killed or they'd left the country. So Alice suggested my father and because he was ideal. You know, he was a doctor, he... He trained in in Vienna and in and in Prague, and yet he was an American, and so, and that was what happened. So in in spring forty six, they returned to Czechoslovakia. My father to organise the medical teaching mission, and Alice to go back and see her family and her friends, and and so on. 
Um, and she stayed. Um, I think near the end of that year, he went back to America to organise the next year's missions. But Alice stayed in Prague because, um, because you know, she'd been away for so long. Yeah, yeah. And can you explain what the political situation was like in in Czechoslovakia during that period? Yeah, I mean, from forty six, there was a coalition government, and the communists were a part of that government with Benesh, who was not a communist. Um, and he tried, Benesh, to tr- to sort of balance the West and the East. He felt that the Czechoslovakia, I mean, they, he'd been in, in, in England during the war, and, and yet he'd had help from the Soviets and had actually returned to Czechoslovakia under the auspices of the Soviet Union via the Soviet Union. But he sort of hoped that he could, he could balance, be at the centre of, of Europe, and and balance the two the two sides that were emerging in in the post war world. Yeah, unfortunately, he you know as time showed he he wasn't able to do that. But at that time, and the communists who were in government were very clever. Really, they started they started working with the grassroots. They started working on the ground with with farmers and with in the in in the different regions in Czechoslovakia and so that people got to know them. And the communists had two advantages. One was that the Americans had agreed to let the Soviets liberate Prague. So General Patton's army had stayed in Pilsen and had not liberated Prague, while Prague was you know, uprising against the Nazis. They, had to, they waited for the Soviets to come in, so they got the kudos for that. And, of course, the Munich Agreement. There was still a lot of resentment in Czechoslovakia about the fact that the West had abandoned them um, at the beginning of the war. They, they had hoped that, um, that, the, the, that France and Britain would help them fight the Nazis. They were ready to fight. There's a letter from my father that he wrote in, in 38 saying that they were all ready to fight. And then, of course, the Munich Agreement gave away the Sudetenland, which is where all their defences were and armaments were situated. And so they had no chance. But in forty eight the communists seized power properly. In forty eight the all of the non communist members of the government resigned in protest at something the communists had done and the and thinking that that would bring down the government. But what it did was hand power to the communists. The communists then just filled their empty posts with communists and so effectively, you know, there was a bloodless putsch or coup. And the communists from from February forty eight the communists were then in full control of Czechoslovakia, yeah. And, and what's happening between Alice and Erwin at, at this time? Um, for those two years, 46 to 48, Erwin was working for the USC and, and Alice was, she was in Czechoslovakia for a while. She did go back with Erwin to America at, um, at the end of 47 and they had a very sad and unhappy Christmas that year. And she was ill and, and, and very, very unhappy at being there. And then after the communist takeover, she wanted to be back in Czechoslovakia and helping to build um, a new communist world, as she saw it. She thought she saw it as that opportunity. And uh, so in March 48, she came back and she got a job in the office of the, um, of the Deputy Prime Minister, Willem Shiroki. And she worked there. And my father had resigned from the USC then. And he was um, he got a job with the World Health Organization in Geneva because he didn't want to live under a communist regime. So effectively, you know, things were they were things were separating between them. But my father's belongings were still in the flat. They, he was still going backwards and forwards. Um, so that was that was sort of where they were in forty eight. And and I think that, that that's a you know it's a. It's another era of the the story here is despite the fact that they appear to be separated, Alice is still looking after his belongings. And, you know, as we move further into this story, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a story about what happens to those um, Mm. belongings as well, but it's as though there's still a connection there. It's not as though they're, you know, these irreconcilable differences, I think the reality is that they did love each other. They, they, they did. And, and I think she, from what she kept about him and what, from what she'd obviously said to other people, she, she loved him. 
um, but she also loved Czechoslovakia and she, she there was her belief in communism but but I think also her home because I think for Erwin Czechoslovakia was his home but never quite in the same way as it was for Alice you know he wasn't born there he was brought up until he was nine in in New York and he was with the US Army for several years and what he saw of the Soviets during his time in the army in Europe hardened him completely against the communists. He was never going to live under under their their, their regime. So it, it it was difficult. It was difficult clearly for them. I think they had a lot of great heartache, the two of them. Yeah. Um, and and you can you can see that in in some later letters. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, in terms of the correspondence between them, did they talk much about politics or? try and avoid that because they knew that you know they were on not what well, not completely opposite sides but you know there was a I don't have many of their letters I mean of the letters I do have that there is are information about the war and then of, and then the letters surrounding their divorce which comes a little bit later in 49 Irwin gets a job at the World Health Organization in Geneva Alice um is staying in Prague but in that year, she's arrested. Yes, and this is where Noel Field comes back into it because Noel Field and Irwin and Alice had been in contact during the USC missions, but Noel Field was dismissed from the USC in uh, 47, again, because of his communist sympathies. And in 48, he was quite worried that his, his American passport was running out and he he was worried that he was not it was not going to be renewed because there were the House Committee for Honor American Activities, the HUAC hearings uh, in America. And and he ended up being named by Whitaker Chambers as a communist during those hearings. And so he, he asked Alice and various other people, other Czech communists, if they would help him get um, a residency visa for, for Czechoslovakia because he felt he would be safe there. And she did help him with that. But then his his passport was renewed and she was slightly suspicious of that. She wondered why it was that that, that had happened and she spoke to the communist authorities about it and she said, yeah, I just wonder. And, and so they said, "Well, can you keep an eye on him and report back anything that um, anything that where, where he is and what he's doing?" And she said she would, which she did. Um, and in October '48, the the New York Herald Tribune printed the information that he had been named as a communist um, by Whitaker Chambers. And he became very worried. And then in December 48, his, his friend from the State Department, who was also uh, working for the, for the Soviet Union, Lawrence Duggan, committed suicide. And so Nolfia was very, very jittery. And he, he was in Prague and he wanted to see Alice. Um, and she had to go away. She was on a, she had to go away for a work trip. She'd actually been demoted from her job as uh, in the Deputy Prime Minister's office and was working for Czech hotels. It just so happened my father was in Prague at the time. Noel Field went and spoke to him and said how worried he was. And so when Alice returned from her trip, my father went back to Geneva. Alice returned from her trip. She contacted Noel Field at his hotel and he wasn't there. His luggage was still there, but he disappeared. And she didn't know what had happened. And her, his wife, was Herta, was very worried about him and assumed that he'd been taken by the Americans. And both Noel Field's wife and Noel Field's brother went looking for him. They came to Czechoslovakia um, and Herman went to Poland because he had contacts there to try and find out what had happened to Noel Field. And both Herman Field, Noel's brother, and, his, and Noel's wife, Herta, also disappeared. Nobody knew where any of them had gone. Um, in fact, both Noel Field and Herta had been arrested and taken to Hungary and Herman Field was detained in Poland. Um, and then the Pavliks disappeared. They were the, the couple whom, whom Alice had known and who recommended Noel Field contact her. And then a friend of hers who'd been in Spain, one of the doctors in Spain, Vlaster, also disappeared. So people were being arrested all around her there in 49. 
was this being orchestrated by the Soviet Union? This the, these these waves of arrests. Yes, it was since since Tito, since Tito had had left the Comintern and had separated Yugoslavia from 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 the Soviet Union, Stalin wanted to increase his hold on the other countries that he saw as being in his sphere of influence. And he started, and the way he wanted to do that was by doing what he'd done in the Soviet Union in the 30s, which was, you know, a reign of terror, show trials, um, proving that there were fifth columnists and, you know, Western spies in the higher echelons of the Communist Party and government in, in Hungary and then in Czechoslovakia. And Noel Field was taken to Hungary, tortured there, as were the Pavliks, um, in order to get evidence for a trial of somebody called Laszlo Rak, R-A-J-K, um, in, in Hungary. And what Stalin did very cleverly with Noel Field was he, he accused Noel Field, or he got people to accuse Noel Field of being an American spy. He was an American, and of course he had lots of contacts with communists, but he wasn't an American spy, he was a communist spy. But he was accused of being an American spy, and anybody who had had contact with him was in danger and was implicated. And um, and that was when people found out where Noel Field was, because in the Rack trial, he was named um, as having been an American spy. And then the pressure moved on into Czechoslovakia and to say to try and find something similar in Czechoslovakia. And in July of 49, Alice also was arrested. And she's held in some quite tough prisons as well. The first prison she was taken to was was Mlada Boleslav, which was a which was an ordinary it was a prison for for regular criminals, but there the secret services commandeered one floor of it for political prisoners because actually that was a very she was amongst the very first ones to be arrested, and they didn't have a um, a, a whole prison designated for political prisoners as they did later. Um, and she was kept, so she was kept there. And I've been to Mlada Boleslav, I've seen it. Uh, it, it. It hasn't been in use as a prison since the 50s, so it's actually very much as it was at that time. It's used as a film set now. Right. And, uh, in fact, I've seen films when I've suddenly gone, oh, my God, I know what that is. That's Mlada Boleslav. <laughs> um, the, the film The Courier with Benedict Cumberbatch quite recently used oh, it. Oh, right, yeah. Um, anyway, and they, the, the Soviets were there, if you like, instructing the Czechs about how to interrogate. You know, they 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 vied with each other for for doing the longest interrogations, and they made people go through their whole life stories and write it all down, and and then go over it all over again and look at any discrepancy and name everybody they'd they'd met. And of course, Alice and other communists just thought it was a mistake. And that as soon as they explained what had really happened, that they would be released and they would be understood. It took them a while to understand that nobody was interested in in the truth. That wasn't that wasn't on the cards at all. Was there a an anti Semitic theme to these trials or these arrests, or was that some of the later trials that I, were... that I think that comes. That comes a little bit later, but oh. yes, I mean she was she was actually released after this first arrest. She was released after about ten months on certain conditions. One was that she give up her her membership of the Communist Party. Another was that she examine her 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 her, her values very carefully. Um, another was that she divorced my father, and finally that she didn't tell people that she'd been she'd been in prison. She was actually sent to a, a resort. Uh, in northern Czechoslovakia for two weeks and then allowed to return home. And she wrote, that was when she wrote to my father and said that they needed to divorce. And I have those letters. I have the, the letters that she wrote and his reply. What were his replies to that? Did he want the divorce as well or? The, the two letters were, were the only two letters I had of hers, then my father had obviously kept them. And they were written in Slovak. And at the time I first had them, I didn't, I couldn't understand Slovak and Google Translate didn't exist. And my husband went to Czech, to Czech Republic and I asked him to take the letters with him and get them translated. And they came back and they said, oh, they're not very interesting. They're, they're just very practical things saying they, about the, the practicalities of the divorce. 
And actually it begins, the letter begins something like this, I've come back from a long trip. And it's clear from my father's reply that he knows exactly where she's been, that he understands exactly that she's been in, in prison. And in fact, I found that there was an, there's another letter that he wrote just after she was arrested the first time, he wrote because he'd been planning to return to Czechoslovakia, to Prague, and he wrote to Eva in the end because he said, I've been writing to Alice and she's not replying and I don't know what's happening. And I don't know what Eva replied, but obviously he realised that he, either she said he, she disappeared or that she'd been arrested. And of course, and he never he could never go back again. So he yeah. understood. I mean, it's clear from his letters that he understood he says so. And he's he's very loving in in what he says to her, um, and um, he goes to see her father's grave, which is in Vienna, and tells her he's 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 taken some care of that, and and so on. It's it's very sad. It it is. This is so. I mean, this is one of the things that drew me to this story because it is, it is a tragic love story. <laughs> um, you know, and how. You know th- those letters that exchange between your your father and Alice. There, they're having to use this coded language. It sounds like he obviously understands that she has to do this yeah. in order to gain her freedom. Yeah. But neither of them really have an appetite to be divorced. It's yeah, yeah incred- incredibly sad. And mm. uh, sadly for Alice, things get worse in 1951. The group that were arrested with Alice, Gottwald and, and, and the Czech authorities, were investigating at the instigation of the Soviets to try and find this conspiracy. And their their view was that there really wasn't a conspiracy. And Stalin said, well, look harder, because I think you'll find there is one. And so <laughs> everything ramped up then. And she was released in March 1950. And... She served the, the the last part of her imprisonment was in Ruzin, which was is a big prison in Prague, and that had been completely converted into a prison a prison for political prisoners. It was entirely for political prisoners, so you can imagine it's a huge prison. Like I've been there as well. Um, they, they knew how many they were going to be arresting. I mean, they they were they were arresting hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, not not just communists, obviously. They were you know, Catholics and priests and dissidents and so on, but also a lot of communists. And they were ramping up to try and find people who were high enough up in the communist hierarchy that that, that would satisfy Stalin's view. Uh, and in the end, of course, they went as as high as as, as the deputy as, as Rudolf Slansky, who was second only to to Gottwald, had spent you know the war in the Soviet Union with Gottwald and was as close as he could be to him. And in February, so Alice was released in March 1950. In February, both her best friends, Helena and Dora, were arrested. And all around, people were, were, were disappearing from the streets, were, were being arrested. And it was only a matter of time, really, before she was arrested again, um, which she was. And throughout that time, I think they used Dora and and Alice and others to gain as much information as they could about the people they wanted to put on trial with Slansky. Um because they they weren't so interested, I think, in Alice and Dora, but just they had the contacts and they could get information from them. And um, the Slancy trial was in November 1952. There were 14 defendants um, and 11 of them were executed. And it was a huge trial. It was it was broadcast across the country. And even the wives of, of, of some of the defendants were um, thought that, believed that their husbands must have done what they said they'd done. Because there were two impossible things to believe. You know, either these people who had been loyal all their lives to the communists who had fought in Spain, who a lot of them were Jewish and had been, you know, been in the resistance and had been in concentration camps, that these people had suddenly been, un- had been undermining the communists all the way along. That was one impossible thing to believe. But the other impossible thing to believe was that they hadn't done it and all these intelligent people had been forced to confess to something that they hadn't done. I mean, obviously, the second was the truth, but it was a hard thing for anybody to believe. And these Slansky trials are quite 
I was going to say famous, but they're they're notorious mm. and are quite a no, certainly a very notable period in in Czechoslovak history and a notable period during the Cold War again because of this Soviet manipulation of Stalin trying to mm. assert his grip on the the countries of Eastern Europe. But there's also the of these defendants, the vast majority of them are Jewish in yeah, the Slansky trial. They are, yeah, eleven. Um, and the, 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 you, you spoke about the, the, the anti-Semitic element, and it was definitely there because, as well as being accused of, of being Titoist and Trotskyist, they were accused of being Zionist. And the attitude to the Jews in, I mean, Jews had been encouraged to join the Communist Party you know, back in the Spanish Civil War or fight against fascism, but Stalin and the Soviet Union had thought that Israel would be an ally. And in fact, the Czechs had sent a lot of the Czech colonies had sent a lot of, of arms to Israel at the beginning of just after the war. But Israel threw its lot in with America, went went on the American side in the Korean War, and um, and Stalin had to had to court somebody else in the Middle East, had to start courting the Arabs, and it was easier, so much easier, to blame Jews within the Communist Party for the support, the previous support of the for Israel. He could he could distance it from himself and blame it on these these Zionist sympathizers, Zionist Trotskyist sympathizers. Um and so that there, there came to be a huge anti Semitic element in all of that. Um and obviously Alice and Dora and Helena were all Jewish as well. And uh, and they, they were in it was it was routine insults as well as as obviously the, the terrible conditions on, on which they were they were kept and interrogated and subjected to, but but in addition you know this, this sort of and and I think so hard for them when they had survived the war that they'd survived the anti the Hitler's anti-Semitism to then find the communists using exactly the same insults. This is a sad story in many ways, but that whole of those people who had dedicated their lives to the fight against fascism and 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 other areas to then find that the system that they believed in was basically going to eat them you know it, it was going to it was going to destroy them yes i mean helena who was alice's school friend um when she was arrested she was incredibly loyal she she worked for the for the czech army after well throughout the war and and after the war and um and she thought that when she was arrested, that there had been a coup. She it never occurred to her that the, her own party would have done that to her. And it was only when she was taken in for interrogation and she saw the picture of Gottwald behind her interrogator on the wall that she realised there hadn't been a coup. And um, and and she then had that she her assumption then was that there'd been a terrible mistake and that they were that that they were mistaken and and. As soon as they again, as soon as they they found out, they would they they, they would change their minds. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So she's she's held in prison. Could Irwin still write to her or communicate with her while she was in prison, or not? No one could communicate with her. Her mother, her mother kept writing to the president and and so asking what had happened to her, where she was, could they hear from her. And uh, and she had no communication with anybody. I mean, I, I'm sure Erwin didn't try to write after their divorce, but uh, but her family tried and and got absolutely nowhere. Yeah. Right. And so, did they know that she was in prison and alive, or they didn't really know where she was and what I, her circumstances were? I, I think they would they would have known had she died. I mean, the only one woman was ever executed, Milada Harakova. So I think. They would have known if she she'd been executed, but um, but uh, th- th- so they just knew that she was in prison, um, yeah. and uh, they may not have known which prison. They would have assumed it was Ruzine, I think, because most political prisoners were in Ruzine, um, and um, and it was and I mean, in nineteen fifty three. Stalin died, and so did Gottwald, and actually after that, although the trials went ahead. That they, they, she, they did get a response to say that she would be, that her trial would be coming up in in spring of of 1954. So she'd been in prison for three years before she was tried. Oh. 
She was charged with espionage, contact with other enemies of democracy and demoralising behaviour in Spain. The return of the stolen <sighs> Came preserves. back to haunt her. Yeah. And in fact, by which time Gottwald had died, the regime had begun to change in the Soviet Union. And she was very, very ill. I mean, the, the, the prison doctor described her as having had anemia, an arterial defect, spinal tuberculosis, intervertebral disc herniation, jaundice, bilateral cytic nerve neuralgia and chronic gastric catarrh. And oh. uh, he, he recommended that if she, you know, if she wasn't released, that she might not survive because the, con- well, the conditions were just unbearable in, in, in the prison. Yeah. Um, and so she was, she was released in 55. Um, and when they finally reviewed her case later, the prosecutor had asked for the, tro- the, the charges to be dropped before, before it had come to trial because they didn't feel it, anything had been, there, there was enough evidence. But the Secret Service put pressure on and insisted that, that she was tried. She was sentenced to eight years. And Dora was sentenced to six because she didn't come from such a bourgeois background. <laughs> she got a, two extra years for being bourgeois. Um, Incredible. But, yes, yeah, she was released in 55. In the meantime, your father has married your mother. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the very, very, again, one of the very sad things. I mean, I'm not sure exactly when she found out, but she found out, she must have found out fairly soon because they had people they were in contact with in common. Um, yeah, that he, that he'd married my mother in 53 and I'd been, I was born a month before her trial. And, um, and they had wanted children. She and my father had definitely wanted children. And my father had thought that she wouldn't have, have, thrown herself so wholeheartedly into the communist cause had she had children maybe she would have been more careful about risking herself if she had had children but I'm sure she would have still been a communist um and so it just seems very sad that um that that added to everything else you know she had to sort of take take that information on board and what what happens to her after her release is she still a believer i think she certainly still believes in the ideals that she believed in when she was young she still ideologically believes in democracy in internationalism in freedom in e- equality yeah, she still has those beliefs and she believes that that's what true communism is however the communist party has moved very very far from that you know it's it's it, it's shut down um, international cooperation. It's become misogynistic. I mean, there, there isn't a woman to be seen in, in the communist government in Czechoslovakia or in the Soviet Union or whatever. Um, and there's certainly no freedom. So it's the party that has changed, that has traduced those ideals. Um, but she, and she wanted to remain or to, to have returned to her, her Communist Party membership, because it was, she was stripped of it. And it took her seven years. She didn't get it back until 1962. Uh, even though she was cleared of, her, of all charges, she didn't get her Communist Party membership back till 62. And then, of course, in 68, uh, the Warsaw Pact troops invade. And that is when she gives up being a communist. That's when she gives up her, her communist membership. But speaking to the sons and daughters of her friends, they that generation continued to believe in those ideals, even though you know they had all either they themselves well, often they themselves, but often you know, their husbands had been had been you know imprisoned and in some cases executed. I guess it's been such a big part of your life for so long. It's that the ideals themselves are sound, but it's the people who are implementing it that have got it wrong. Yeah. Because I remember reading somewhere about, you know, when people were arrested during Stalin's purges that, you know, that people were writing to Stalin because they thought he must not know about this. (laughs) You know, he must not know it's, it's these people further down that Mm. are doing these arrests and, you know, Uncle Joe would never allow this sort of stuff. Mm. And I mean, to be fair, until 68, 
I don't think there was a very strong feeling. There was there was a belief in 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 the lead up to sixty eight that it might be possible to have communism with a human face. That was the Dubček yeah. thing, wasn't it? That 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 it it would be possible to have freedom and you know fairness and equal and equality. Um, it's only really after sixty eight that that and what was called normalization in in Czechoslovakia that that you get such a such an overwhelmingly negative response to communism and it persists to this day i mean understandably so, but mm. what has happened is that all communists have been tarred with the same brush, and that people like Alice and you know, some of the ideological communists of the twenties and thirties and who became victims of the regime are not seen as victims their, their their deaths and their their imprisonments are not counted in the figures their names are not are not put on the memorials um and it feels you know they were the ones who were they were betrayed in others eyes i guess they're seen as complicit because they did support the regime mm. initially yeah. i know it came back to bite them but mm-hmm. you know they were Naive, I guess, yeah. is is how somebody would would counter that. But they couldn't know, could they? When they were young, they couldn't know that yeah. that was how it would turn out. Yeah, and I think it, it that's one of the things I find fascinating about the the ideology of of the Cold War, because certainly in well, this sort of forms way before the Cold War, because if you look at groups like the Cambridge Five. Mm-hmm. They were very much ideological spies. Mm-hmm. They thought that they were spying for a greater good rather than a, a national mm. viewpoint. And whichever way you look at them, that that was their their belief. Maybe in later times, certainly when they ended up in the Soviet Union, they realised that perhaps it wasn't all as no. um, you know good as they thought it was going to be. I mean, there is a lot of. I mean, there have been quite a few books, haven't there, and, and sort of arguments that that the sharing of information with the Soviet Union through various spy networks actually kept the peace during the Cold War because um, you know, the, the the two sides came to understand through back channels that that neither side wanted not wanted a hot war. Yeah. So what what happens to you, to Irwin's stuff that Alice has been hanging on to? <laughs> well, everything was confiscated when she was arrested. When she was arrested the second time, um, the um, the STB, who are the, the secret police, um, went through the flat and and confiscated. Uh, they, they 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 were there for twenty four hours, going through and and confiscating belongings and paperwork. And I mean that's one of the reasons I've actually got letters and documents from my father because they were confiscated by the STB when Alice was was arrested so there's a the letter describing what he did at the end of the war I would never have had had it not been had it not been um in the files yeah in the files and there are things like there are you know there are inventories of all their possessions all their rosenthal um crockery and all their their crystal and so on and it gives a very vivid picture to have a list of all all that their possessions um, that that I would just never have had had this not happened. I mean, I don't wish I don't wish this to have happened to them, but there is a sort of irony in 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 how much I've been able to find out because of the thoroughness of the Communist Party and all all that it kept. Um, so I mean, he obviously those things were ne- his possessions were never returned to him. And, yeah. uh, and Alice only got back a certain amount of what was confiscated from her. She actually had to buy back her own crockery. There was a there was a there was a government there were sort of government shops that sold off the property of of the people who were arrested and and the, the, all the property that was confiscated. She had to buy back some of her own china. Unbelievable, mm. unbelievable. Did she live to see the Velvet Revolution? Oh, sadly, not. She died two years she, two years before. Um, she died in eighty six, so she didn't. But um, she, 
she remained friends. I mean, the, the Alice and Dora and Helena, the two who, who had been in Spain with her, remained friends to the end of their lives. They both died before she did. And uh, she was very close to them and their children. And when she retired, she she worked when she was released for um, a book, a book publishers. She worked in the legal department. And when she retired, she taught English to often the, the sons and daughters of her friends. And thank goodness she did, because that's how I've been able to communicate with them. I mean, my Czech is improving now. I actually probably could do it in Czech. But to begin with, I really couldn't. And um, when I was in Prague in the summer of 2019, I went to the flat that she lived in at the end of her life, um, which is now lived in by the daughter of the woman who wrote the memoir about her. Uh, she she inherited she was she took it over when Alice died, and so and some of her furniture was still there, and so we sat at the table where Alice used to teach them English in the flat where wow. she lived, uh, talking to two of the people whom she taught. It was it was. It felt, you know, it was it was it was lovely to be able to do that. Wow, that's incredible! Yeah. Incredible. What what's next for this story? What 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 are you what, intending to do next? Um, I have I have written it up as a book, and what I'm going to try and do is get it published. Um, I've also set up setting up a website to try and put on it um, a, a lot of the information I have, so that you know other people who are researching you know related stories have access to it it doesn't just disappear after after i've gone and um and i'm i'm thinking i might do an mphil as well so to, to look at slightly more academic more official way there's further information such as photos and videos in our episode notes which will show as a link in your podcast app Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.